Hello and welcome to today's webinar for mental health professionals treating anxiety and depression in gender diverse populations featuring Dr. Lauren Wadsworth. My name is Vicki Spielman and I am the Associate Director of Membership and Marketing at ADAA. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer's audio system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select phone call in the audio panel and the dial-in information will be displayed. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available as an on-demand webinar within 24 hours. All attendees should ensure they remain muted for the entire presentation to avoid background noise and distractions. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions at any time of the presentation by typing your questions into the chat box of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session. For those who purchased CE CME credit for this webinar, you will receive an email with a link to complete the webinar survey and post test questions required to receive a CE CME certificate shortly. After the completion of this webinar, please, please reach out to webinars at adaa.org if you do not receive this link. I would, like, I would like to now introduce Dr. Lauren Wadsworth. Dr. Lauren Wadsworth clinical practice and research primarily focused on transdiagnostic features of anxiety disorders with additional specialties treating anxiety in LGBTQ plus populations and providing ERP for OCD. Dr. Wadsworth's clinical interests include providing evidence-based treatments, primarily CBT, ERP, and acceptance-based strategies to individuals with anxiety and depressive disorders in outpatient settings. Dr. Wadsworth's clinical and research work are both largely informed by a commitment to continuously striving to increase her cultural humility as a clinician and researcher. There will now be a brief moment of silence while I pass the presenter role to Dr. Wadsworth. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for having me um, come and do this presentation, and I really appreciate everyone that is here today um, watching this uh, webinar, given that it's such a stressful time, um, given everything that's happening happening in our country. So I really just want to say that I appreciate people coming out and being here um, to learn about how to treat anxiety and depression in gender diverse populations. Okay, so today I'm going to do a very quick background on health disparities in gender diverse populations, but I'm going to assume that if you're here at this talk, you know there's an issue or many issues and you'd like to do better. So I'm going to focus primarily on intake recommendations, clinical recommendations, and a heavy emphasis on giving you a bunch of takeaways. My hope is that you can have 20 to 30 things written down on your notepad at the end of today that are specific behaviors you can engage in that would be different. The trans community experiences pervasive discrimination. This is data from 2014 in Massachusetts, which I share primarily because um, it is considered one of the most liberal states and accepting states, and also because that's where I did my um, graduate training. Um, the, you can see here that there is a huge amount of um, discrimination happening in public transportation, re retail establishment, restaurants, public gathering, and healthcare settings. And these are the percentages of individuals who identify as trans experiencing um, discrimination just in the past year. So 65% experiencing discrimination in public. Of course, that doesn't involve or include family discrimination or interpersonal dynamics, which we know are highly pervasive and life-threatening. 
More than a fifth of trans people have reported hate crimes and that are per, per, perpetu, um, perpetrated on the basis of the victim's real or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. So this is hate crimes in 2014 in the United States, 40% um, based on race, and then quickly followed by sexual orientation, and you see gender identity down here. Um, that number might look low, but I'd remind you of all of the deaths that we have experienced um, of trans people, especially trans people of color and trans women of color being the most at risk. And these are some images of those who we have lost. I'd also invite you to remember that many people hold multiple identities across these different columns. So just because one column might be relatively low, think about the compounding factor if someone identifies as a gender, gender sexual, and racial minority or marginalized within those identities. Um, there's a Lauren, I'm going to interrupt you for one minute. Please hold on. It sounds like you're muted. Disorders. So it's good that we're here talking about this topic today. Um, ranging from 17 to 68%. Obviously, we have a lot more research to do on the in the population to get more specific numbers, but we also have a lot to learn in terms of the actual prevalence rate of individuals who don't identify as cisgender, meaning um, born the same gender as they identify today. The most common anxiety disorders in the trans community include specific phobias and social anxiety, followed by panic and OCD. So I'm gonna start the takeaways here, um, jumping right in. So the first thing that you often do as a clinic or um, a researcher is collect demographic forms. And those of you that have seen my talks before know that it's something I highly value and think is an underappreciated way that we can intervene and make things more comfortable and um, affirming for gender diverse patients and research participants. So oft, it's extremely important and can be extremely effective to make conclusive and affirming intake processes or demographic questionnaires when you have a new patient coming in or you are doing a research study. Sometimes people will come to me and say that this is a big dilemma because they're trying to balance um, efficiency and accuracy. So, Folks will say, you know, I want to make inclusive demographic forms, like have tons of options for patients, but I don't want it to take up too much time or make too much work for them to read. And I think it's just really important to say that um, even though it might look like a long list of gender identities that you are offering people, that's actually pretty quick to read and people know how they identify. So it doesn't take up more time to offer more affirming um, lists. And I'll give some examples of that in a minute. So most studies in the past in you know, measuring sexual orientation, for example, have had underrepresented checkboxes like heterosexual or gay slash lesbian. Um, that means that we have less inclusivity, which gives pa patients and research participations um, the option of leaving the item blank, which loses important data or can hurt the clinical report, or check a box that doesn't accurately reflect them which again gives us inaccurate data or provides a misunderstanding of our patients. So we um, think this is important because it can alienate participants if you don't see your identities represented. And it can give a an um, impression of the degree to which the field of psychology values that person, right? So if you're coming in and you identify as gender queer and you're asked to select between male and female, or man and woman, then what does that mean about the clinic you're about to start um, seeing a therapist in? What does that mean about the therapist themselves? What does that mean about the research study that you're about to be a part of? Do you really want to enter into that relationship or do that work of being in a boring research study for a couple hours or getting stressed out in that study if the person doesn't even 
know that you exist or value capturing your existence in as a data point. So I think just to kind of underline that point, each time we're handing out a demographic form, we're showing, we're giving information to a person about how much our field has thought about them, cares about them, is willing to take the time to go into Word and add a couple more items or Google a list of affirming gender identity labels that people are using, um, and then print out a new form after this talk. So, you know, is it something that you really don't have time for, or is it something that that could make a big difference and doesn't actually take that much time. So oftentimes we're seeing people that are starting to embark on this, making a pretty um, short list. So for example, in sexual orientation, heterosexual, gay or lesbian, bisexual, and then having an other option. This is a, a way that you can make a brief list and not take up a, a lot of space, quote unquote. However, we would recommend that you um, use write-in instead of other. So other can be othering um, and might feel sort of alienating to a patient or a research participant. So I would just recommend going with the term write-in your response or um, not listed, please describe or please write in. So it's a little bit more inclusive and less othering, if you will. So let me just, I know those were a couple examples of sexual orientation. Um, let me give a list of um, gender identities that we might include on a more inclusive questionnaire. So here, and I'm gonna go into a couple of definitions, so bear with me if you already know what all of these mean. Um, you might start out with female as first. Um, typically demographic forms start out with the most prevalent or dominant group like male, white, straight as the first item on the list. And it can just be super empowering to flip that up and show that you know you thought about that, you've broken outside of your typical um, the typical norm and did something like put female first or what if you even put trans first? you know what are your assumptions or fears that come up when you imagine that and would that be worth challenging? So male, female, um, trans male, trans female, trans. Um, you might be confused at why that's broken into three parts. Some people identify as trans men, some as trans women, some just identify as trans simply um, because it's used as an umbrella term to mean things outside of cisgender, which again is if you were born the same identity and gender as you um, labeled the same at birth as you identify now. So trans could just mean I don't identify within that binary or I'm somewhere between the two or um, I'm not sure. So some people use that word as more of an umbrella identity. Gender queer is another umbrella term to embrace anything outside of that male, female, cisgender binary. Um, Non-binary would be if you strongly don't feel like you fit in either box that society has built up, either of those um, two categories, that you're outside of it all together. Gender non-conforming, gender expansive, gender fluid are other ways that people identify some of them as umbrella terms and others. Um, I guess what I want to say at this point is that those the last four on that list is aside from agender, it's important to ask the patient what that means to them because there are nuances within the community on what those specific terms mean. But you can assume that they're not identifying as cisgender in a traditional, you know, male born male assigned male at birth. A gender would mean that they don't identify with, an, with a gender at all. Um, and gender fluid means that their gender can change from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. Um, this is something that I've heard is challenging for clinical staff to get on board with, um, having a difficult time switching between pronouns that they're using to refer to patients. Um, I validate that it is hard to switch and to know um, how someone identifies at a certain moment. If they're gender fluid, it can change pretty rapidly. So I would just um, re recommend using the report to figure out what is the best way to find or signal switches between genders. So maybe it's wearing a certain pin or maybe a certain hat or 
maybe a certain color shirt so that the staff know what the signal is without having the um, patient or the client have to keep reminding people. It's important in your studies and in, um, in clinical intake forms to ask about sex assigned at birth and gender identity separately. Maybe you don't even need to ask sex assigned at birth if it's um, not clinically relevant or relevant for the research study that you're doing. So I would just come back to why you need to know. Um, know that for trans folks or folks that don't identify as cis, um, it can be triggering to just answer that question or to come out in that way. So just wondering if it's important to ask in the first place, but um, being clear about what you're asking about. Are you asking about what genitals does someone have? Maybe that's a question that you ask separately if you, for some sort of um, medical reason, if you need to know what, um, if they have XY chromosomes, XX, et cetera, asking that question, right? And then asking separately, do you identify as intersex or having a difference of sex development? This has been hugely under-researched and underappreciated in terms of prevalence rates and um, has been removed in many ways um, from our conversations and understanding about gender. So this is a demographic forum recommendation that I'll just share. Um, we made at UMass Boston a comprehensive demographic questionnaire and published it for free in the Behavior Therapist. So you can easily find that um, by Googling ways to boost, boost your research rigor through increasing your cultural competence. And it comes with a lot of awesome other tips too. Um, and just some data to show why it's important to ask and expand the way that we do intakes um, in our clinical and research settings. So we did a study where we just looked at what are the differences in social anxiety levels in sexual orientations um, from heterosexual, lesbian, and gay, those typical ones that are asked, and then right in response and bisexual. And we saw that it's actually the two groups um, surrounded in red had the highest levels of social anxiety, significantly higher than the other two groups. And we wouldn't have had that data if we didn't offer a more inclusive demographic form. So asking identi identity informed research questions um, can be done if you're collecting accurate, inclusive and affirming research um, demographic data. It can help you expand the research that you're doing by looking at subgroup differences between sexual and gender minorities or majorities, and ask if the prevalence rates of what you're studying are similar across different domains of gender expression and identity, and um, asking if folks that are gender diverse respond as well to this treatment. That's something that we don't know a lot about, and every RCT, every study that's being done now in the field of psychology could benefit from asking that question. So that's a whole other paper you can write if you wanna put it that way. Let's get into some clinical recommendations. Um, I'll start out with reminding folks or introducing them to the Addressing Framework by Dr. Pamela Hayes. This is a way that we can quickly remind ourselves or check in with the different sociocultural identities that we each hold that um, Dr. Pamela Hayes um, hypothesizes are most correlated with our mental health. We do a little bit, I, me and my McLean colleagues have made a couple adjustments in here to make sure we're capturing mental health specifically, and you'll see that as we go through. So age, disability status, diagnosis status, AG mental health, religion, spirituality, ethnicity and race, which really should be two different categories in the acronym, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, indigenous heritage and immigration status, nation of origin and citizenship status, and gender and gender expression. So I remind listeners today of this framework because oftentimes we do these talks in bubbles, um, in columns, you know, looking at gender, diversity and within anxiety and depressive disorders. And it's really just way more complicated than that. So I've been thinking a lot about um, our gender diverse patients and research participants going through this past few weeks of COVID and the recent events um, with George Floyd and how that might be impacting their mood and mental health um, over and above what typically would be happening. And then add in things like 
race and ethnicity and sex, um, sexual orientation and socioeconomic status, and you're just having compounding levels of marginalization, and that's going to likely have exponential um, effects on mood and mental health. So whenever we're working with patients, making sure that we're seeing them within the sociocultural framework and considering the intersection of different identities they have and how that might be furthering the burden that they're enduring or the, the um, financial risk of things like coming out. And we'll get into some of those specifics later. But I would just ask you to keep this framework in mind. And as I'm sharing recommendations, think about how would this be different in my client who is trans and of color? Or how would this be different in my client that's trans and gay? Okay, so example number one, apologize when you make mistakes. So I'll just start out with a little bit of a story where I had one of my first intakes ever um, and I was trying to be inclusive. Um, I went to a program that was hugely social justice oriented and I make tons of mistakes every day. So here's one of them. Um, I did an intake with a person that presented um, for therapy and I thought, you know, they looked female and had short hair. And so halfway through session, I was kind of reflecting a statement about them and their family of origin and said, you know, is your father's daughter, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of session, I asked if there's anything else the patient wanted to share. And they said, yeah, I'm actually um, genderqueer. And I think I might identify as a trans male. And it just hit me, wow, I just totally assumed that patient's gender their gender expression, um, their trajectory. I just, you know, hadn't even asked that question. So that was a huge mistake. And I apologized for it in the moment saying, wow, I'm remembering, I, I said daughter, when I was um, reflecting back to you and they said, oh, you know, it's fine. But, you know, I think it's really important to apologize and say, I really should have asked you how you identify in the beginning before I even used examples or words like that. So an adjustment that I've made is um, both myself and in our clinic is adding the addressing framework. So we do the, the mini diagnostic interview and then we go right into the addressing framework and ask people how they identify across that whole list and then ask for each of those, if those influence the person's mood or mental health, um, if that influences what they're coming to treatment for, and if that's something that brings them a source of strength, stress, both or neither, so that just in that first session, we can already show that identities are important to us as clinicians. We want to know how you identify. We don't want to make assumptions. And we also want to know, is this relevant to your treatment? So just because you're a trans person of color doesn't mean that you want to talk about being trans or, or race in session. Um, and making sure that we give people the space and the platform to share that opening the door, being the broker of that conversation, if you will. So apologize when you make mistakes. Even the most culturally competent or humble might be a better term, clinician um, makes mistakes. And sexual and gender minority patients might be more sensitive to micro or macro aggressions due to a history of rejection and lack of visibility in culture, right? So there's that whole mosquito bite metaphor where if you experience one microaggression that week or that year, sure, it might not be big, but if it's the 15th one that you've experienced today, then you might have a big reaction uh, based on that, that, that history of that trauma. So it's important for us to note that we're not speaking to patients in vacuums and what we say could be um, heard in this compounding um, series of microaggressions. So apologize quickly and move on. I think the move on part is really hard, especially as a white person. Um, I know that I've struggled with not getting the um, reassurance that everything's okay and we're good. Um, so be, be mindful of the fact that by hanging out, by being like, no, I'm really so sorry. What can I do? You know, waiting for that person to say it's okay is putting even more burden on the person that you've microaggressed against and the person that's already coping with enough. So making sure to move on quickly and gracefully after apologizing. 
pronouns. So go beyond the intake paperwork and ask people the name and pronouns that they go by. I think this has been talked about a lot, which I think is fantastic. I would just offer some specific tweaks to the suggestions out there. Um, try not to assume what gender pronouns someone uses, as I did. Ask, what are your pronouns? Um, we're not recommending people ask for preferred pronouns because that makes it sound like a preference or, oh, it would be great if. Um, instead, what are your pronouns? Just treating it like a normal thing as it is and to not make it seem like it's something that you're making a special accommodation for someone. You could do this a little bit more naturally by introducing yourself and your pronouns first. So, hi, I'm Dr. Wadsworth. I go by she, hers pronouns. What name would you like me to call you and what pronouns do you use? Or what are your pronouns? Know that pronouns can change. As I mentioned with gender fluid individuals, they might change by the minute. Um, and in patients or individuals that are going through a journey of a, learning and understanding or exploring or shifting through gender expressions, there could be changes in pronouns throughout your treatment. So being prepared to shift and be comfortable with that. I think from what I've heard in trainings, it's hard for people at first um, to get that cognitive flexibility of shifting between pronouns um, or using new pronouns for someone that they've known their whole lives. and that's totally valid and is definitely a difficult, you know, mental task to do initially. But if you practice, you will get better at it. Um, I think I might mention this later, but um, something that I often recommend in, in staff meetings um, or in team meetings that people are doing, it can be a good time to practice this flexibility. So if a, if a clinical group is struggling with pronoun usage, I would recommend that in staff meetings, they try to do 15 minutes or 30 minutes or in clinical case discussions do you know 10 minutes where they try not to use any gender pronouns so just saying they or the person's name so that you can get used to that um, that language because the more you do it the easier it gets and it can be pretty empowering and fun to get better at it so i would just re recommend practicing and if it feels like you're working in a space where that's not safe to suggest, then it's something you can practice at home with your family or with friends that share similar values and goals to you. So, hey, let's try to share stories from our week and not use pronouns as we do it. So that would look like, you know, I ran into Jimmy at the store today and Jimmy uh, mentioned that he had bought, oh, I just said he. So Jimmy had mentioned that they had bought some cookies or Jimmy mentioned that Jimmy had bought some cookies, right? So correcting yourself on the fly, you could, if you're in a trusted space, ask people to correct you, maybe hold up a finger or ring a bell if you use a pronoun when you're trying not to. People can go by multiple pronouns. So someone might say, you can call me she, her, or they, them pronouns. Um, and they can change frequently, as I've mentioned. Use your privilege for good. Put pronouns in your email signature line. I'm seeing a lot of this these days and it's so heartening. If you're really nervous about doing it, you can do it like this example here where I've made it really small at the bottom. Um, this is a good option if you're a trainee or in your relatively lower in a hierarchical system where you're worried about making a fuss. Um, this is a you know quote unquote safer way to do it. I'm now seeing people put it right under their name in the same size font, and I think that's so awesome. So especially if you're in a leadership position, um, trying to use that privilege for good and to normalize putting pronouns in a signature line, not because people wouldn't guess yours, maybe, um, but because there might be employees that people aren't guessing right, and it would be really nice for them to be able to have this look like a normal thing and to be a normal thing to have in a signature line. Okay, so I had a client who had a strong desire to be not referred to as female anymore or misgendered as female by strangers, family, and friends and wondered if they should get top surgery. So this was a big assumption that I had. I, I thought, okay, all right, that means this is my first trans patient and we're gonna go through this whole transition and um, 
they're going to be so much happier and I should probably call them key now and they're going to go on T and you know get top surgery and then bottom surgery right I totally jumped into that assumption I jumped into that box of what that what that first statement meant um and what I noticed clinically was that when I would, you know, help, I would make recommendations, thought I was being helpful, say, oh, we could explore this, this group, that, you know, hormone, et cetera, that physician, the patient would then jump into the alternative. So, oh, maybe actually I just want to wear dresses for a bit. And it confused me a lot. I didn't understand what was happening. But ultimately, I learned that my job wasn't to say, okay, you want to be trans and let's do this. It was to really just in that moment validate the stress of that the client was feeling existing in a world that was set up with these gender boxes. So it wasn't that the patient at that moment was identifying as a trans male and wanted to go through all these steps. It was that the patient was expressing, I don't want people to keep looking at my chest and ascribing me the, the gender identity female. That was really it, right? So validating that, helping, you know, think about ways that we could do that, um, maybe a binder, maybe top surgery, but not think, not then thinking this is a whole trajectory that I know where it's going, right? Instead, sitting with the patient, being more patient-centered or client-centered and following their lead um, and validating first that the world that they're living in is so gendered and that isn't helpful or affirming if you don't identify within those boxes. So the number one thing would be to create a safe and supportive space for the client um, that require they don't choose a gender identity or you know, meet a certain threshold or level. I think as myself as a cisgender clinician, it was my original assumption of like, okay, you're going from this box to that box, but it's way more complex than that. So instead, can you create a setting in your office where they don't need to be one or the other, this or that, or I'm definitely gender fluid or I'm definitely gender non-conforming, but instead just making initial space for them to explore what they like about feminine ideas or masculine ideas or non-conforming ideas or two-spirit ideas, what that feels like, what emotions come up, what thoughts come up um, in a space where they're not worried about how that impacts you or affects you. Because I think this is something that's so prevalent in the work clinically is patients struggling with, um, I am worried about hurting my family or my mom always has this reaction when I say I want her to do this thing differently and so much of it is social. So if you can create an environment in your clinical setting where you're not bringing in your assumptions, you're working to notice those assumptions you bring in and try to remove all of those systemic boxes, um, that can be really freeing to help the patient figure out their true deep feelings about their gender and expression and help them get to the a point that would make them most happy and affirmed. And empower your patient to discover and express the gender, their gender in ways that feel right to them. So it's okay if you don't fit within a box. It can be very anxiety provoking. It can be daunting to know that you're embarking in a whole life where you're going to be moving against people's assumptions. That can bring up so much social anxiety and panic every time someone's going into public spaces. So, you know, you're starting to think about how that might impact clinical conceptualizations. So what I've kind of been highlighting is that it's important not to impose your culture, your values. Don't assume that someone wants to look a specific gender. For example, if they identify as trans and they were assigned male at birth, the end goal might not to be looking feminine with lipstick and long hair and whatever we, we assume to be most feminine. Not everyone that identifies as trans would, wants to pursue medical intervention. Um, there are whole different levels of, of transition that people can go through, includes, including changing clothing, haircut, and per, um, physical appearance only, training a voice up and down without the use of hormones, taking hormones, having top surgery, bottom surgery. But just to say again, an individual does not need to do any of the following changes to be a real woman. So even if someone appears 
totally masculine, they can still identify as female, feminine, woman, um, that's okay. If a person does desire to um, express a desire to explore hormones or surgery, do your homework about state and national policies, help them navigate potential roadblocks that may be financial, social or family rejection, workplace discrimination. Know that, you know, starting to follow those or work towards those interventions might create social or family rejection and homelessness. They could result in homelessness. So be careful to not push your agenda of like, let's move through this quickly be without assessing the danger of doing that with the patient. Help them cope with identity related and non-related, um, identity related distress. So experiences of being misgendered, school stress, co-occurring social anxiety, all the typical things, right? Quote unquote, that we are working with, agoraphobia, OCD, depression, same skills, right? So CBT, DBT, ERP, ACT, all of these skills are also helpful to gender diverse patients. There are some caveats, which I will get into in a minute. Um, recognizing stress due to marginalization and help that patient externalize or decenter from that stress to reduce the pain and internalization um, that could take place. So. What that means in a nutshell is validating, yes, you know, I totally get it that you're so anxious to go into social situations because you are likely to get misgendered. And that pain, that anxiety that you're feeling, let's make sure to put that pain where it belongs, right? That's not something that needs to be deep down within you, rooted in you as a problem within you. That is a problem with society. That's not a problem with you. You're not broken or weird it's the world that you're walking into in public spaces that's that's not um, set up right, that's not affirming and that's not okay. So that ugh, feeling, that scared feeling that you're having is due to the society being messed up, not you being messed up. Doing exercises to help the person decenter um, that pain onto where it really belongs and the responsibility of where it really belongs, which is on the society. Um, this is the same across different marginalized identities or historically marginalized identities. There's likelihood of internalized stigma. So external invalidation becomes internal validation. You, um, it would be beneficial to provide psychoed on exploring internalized stigma, right? Do you have assumptions that being trans is bad or not as good or, you know, hurtful to people? And are you, you know, more likely to be friends with people that aren't trans? You know, what are those ways that you are taking on those messages from society? Discussing experiences of external validation and how those might have contributed to internalized messages. And the therapist's job is to validate the client's feelings and resulting thoughts and behaviors. So it makes sense that you feel unlovable given the messages you received growing up do some cognitive diffusion. So, you know, the thoughts of trans kids are a disappointment to their families, or I'm a disappointment to my family. We can diffuse that to, I'm having the thought that trans kids are disappointments to their families, or I was told that trans kids are disappointments, and just getting space from that. So it could be true that your parents are disappointed with you that you're trans, and that doesn't mean that every trans kid is a disappointment or that you are a disappointment. It's that your parents are holding that disappointment, right? So doing that externalization, that decentering. Recognize that thoughts might be habitual and not factual. I think someone's microphone is on because I can hear them typing. Um, understand and effect, um, acknowledge the effects of homophobia and transphobia. Do psychoeducation on this. Um, psychoed on microaggressions help folks recognize microaggressions that are happening to them. For example, I couldn't tell you were trans. You're so pretty. Um, macroaggressions, being kicked out of the bathroom. Hey, you're in the wrong room. Um, systemic oppression, so removal of state protection of trans individuals in the workplace. So when those laws are changing, making sure you're checking in at the beginning of session 
whoa, a lot happened this weekend with legislation. How are you feeling? How is that impacting you, et cetera? So making sure that you're staying in tune is another take home. Um, identify what parts of the pain of marginalization are due to societal beliefs like stigma and marginalization and help them externalize that pain again as to a problem due within society versus a problem within me. So um, when it comes to anxiety disorders more specifically, my favorite topic, um, before assuming that it's an anxiety disorder, in a person that holds marginalized identities, make sure to drill down a little bit deeper. So if someone says, I'm scared to go into crowded spaces, you could automatically check, oop, yep, agoraphobia, let's do some exposures, let's get out there, let's go out to a big crowded space together right now, you know. They might say, I don't like using public bathrooms. You might think, oh yeah, that's on the ATIS for social anxiety. That's probably social anxiety. Ask if it's someone that holds marginalized, marginalized identities or maybe anyone, um, what past experiences inform this worry? So what if the sentence ended with, I'm scared to go into crowded spaces because so many people look at me closely in some point and stare based on how I look, right? that's probably gonna change how you approach this case. Instead of just jumping into exposure, you might talk about um, self-protective strategies. You might talk about choosing if you're gonna go into crowded spaces, knowing this is, this is probably gonna happen based on how many, you know, how much emotional resources you have stored up that day, who you're with, are there safe people that can come that act as bystanders, et cetera. Maybe the person doesn't like using public bathrooms because it makes other people uncomfortable and they can tell that the woman next to them is looking at the, the woman sign on the door and looking at the person and looking back and forth, right? Like I wouldn't want to use a public bathroom either if that was happening to me. So again, jumping right into exposures or cognitive restructuring might do more harm than good. So that's one of the caveats for using CBT is beware that using traditional CBT or cognitive restructuring might be pretty harmful. So if you were to say, are you sure? Are you 100% sure that people look at you closely in point and stare? What evidence do you have that you make people uncomfortable? What's the worst that could happen? How bad is that? Right? Well, the worst that could happen is death. And that's pretty bad. And the numbers show that especially in trans people of color, it's Pretty, there's a high likelihood of, of this real threatened, life-threatening danger, especially based on regions that people are in. So this can increase pain by being invalidating. It can make the person feel like it's their responsibility, right? If you're doing cognitive restructuring, then kind of the assumption is you're having um, some stuck points or you're having some cognitive errors and we need to fix those. So it can make the person, it can do the opposite of that decentering and make it feel like it's their fault. It's they are the ones that need to hold the pain, suck it up or change. And it can send the signal that you don't understand or see the marginalization pattern that's occurring. So here's an alternative example. That sounds uncomfortable or I don't like using public bathrooms because it makes people uncomfortable. You might validate say, hey, that sounds uncomfortable for you too. Can you tell me more about what's happened in the past? Well, women stare at me examining my chest to see if I'm a woman, I think, because they're scared that I'm a dude and I'm in the woman's room. I don't feel like I fit in the woman's room or the men's room. So you might respond with, wow, sounds like you have a lot to think about just to use the bathroom. I'm sorry that it's like that. It seems like the world wasn't set up for, in a way that's comfortable for you. And, and that's really unfortunate. It's definitely not your responsibility to make other people feel at ease around you, and it should be that way already. Given this pain, are there ways that you, um, and the way that things are now, can we think about ways to navigate the world in a safe way? So you can enjoy outings and other places where you might need to use a restroom, right? So looking for um, restrooms without gender labels on them, bringing a friend, um, sometimes I use a strategy with friends where we talk the whole time. So I'm kind of signaling as a person that's described female, yep, this person's in the right room. I know them. Um, we're acting normal, quote unquote. Um, address and treat the internalized stigma. So notice identity related 
negative self-talk. I'm a disappointment because I'm attracted to women. I wish I wasn't. Um, you might ask, you might say, I'm curious to hear where this statement comes from. What experiences have you had that led to this thought? And how do these experiences impact how you see yourself and how you go about the world? And help them create a more contextual understanding. My parents told me they're just disappointed because I'm gay. Okay. My parents have these beliefs because of what they were taught as normal and what they've always expected of me. And then I felt shame because my parents said this. However, my girlfriend and friends don't see me as a disappointment, so I don't deserve that label as a comprehensive label. And then again, so you're seeing the cognitive triangle playing out, thoughts, feelings, behaviors. I'm sad my parents are disappointed that I'm gay, but that doesn't mean that I'm a bad person, right? So we haven't changed or undone these negative messages because those are real things said to the patient, but we can contextualize them understand them, have empathy from where they come from, and also identify safe pockets or safe people or spaces where this message wasn't necessarily the case. Um, some quick things I'm just going to throw at you before we go to the question session section. Um, tread carefully when encouraging people to come out. Your patients might come every week and say, oh, I just wish I was out. I wish everyone knew it would be so much easier not to hide things anymore but know that coming out um, can have some really negative impacts. So coming out risks the loss of, um, of families, of friends, religious communities, jobs, homes, could include increased work or school harassment, rejection, physical and verbal abuse, sabotage, increased discrimination. Um, on the other hand, staying closeted has um, an external locus of control, a greater fear of negative evaluation, more fortune telling, increased depression and anxiety. Um, on the flip side, coming out um, can decrease anxiety, shame and depression, which is pretty cool, and has the potential to re reduce avoidance and help with anxiety disorders. Um, where on the flip side, staying closeted has the benefit of experiencing less discrimination. So. As you can see, no wonder our patients are so depressed or anxious. Um, there's a lot to weigh here, and it can feel pretty hopeless inducing to have to make this choice on a daily basis, minute to minute, relationship to relationship. A little side note, coming out is a lifelong process. Um, as someone that's a member of the queer community, I have to come out every time I meet someone new. Everyone assumes I'm straight. so. Um, just because someone comes out once doesn't mean it's the last time, and most likely it's definitely not the last time, especially if someone's going through a, tr a, a transition or if they identify outside of those gender binaries. Note that even if you have a release to speak to family, you might know things a family does not, so be very careful not to out people to their, to their families because this could be life-threatening and be a huge risk to the person's finances and housing. Um, if the patient is out and experiencing family stress, including the repair might not be healthy at any given time. So just be careful to weigh out all these things and remember that if things really go south with family, the person could end up homeless. And know that family support saves lives. So studies have shown that if you can get family on board once the client has come out and you can provide resources, support groups, community to family members and help them become more affirming and supportive. We can decrease the risk of suicide with our patients. Remember that your new queer client or your new gender queer client or trans client is not your last one. Everyone's different. There are huge ranges within each of these identities. Um, sexual and gender minorities have a huge range of identities and experiences, plus we all have other identities as well, like a race and age, a, um, religion, maybe spirituality, nation of origin, etc. So remembering intersectionality and how that influences all these factors. I recommend the following resources and clinical um, and clinical resources going forward. Um, these are great websites that stay up to date. And if you were to just maybe spend 10 minutes a week or you know, 20 minutes a month looking through these websites, you will stay on top of things in a way that most clinicians don't. And that's an incredibly empowering and helpful thing to your patients. 
For help with insurance coverage and legal issues, I highly recommend these websites. You don't need to recreate the wheel. There are a lot of people out there doing this work and making these resources very accessible and easy to understand. Patients and their families might, might check out these websites. There are a bunch of um, fantastic pamphlets online that can be emailed to families as PDFs. Um, how to be a trans ally is a great one that you can Google. And we'll stop there for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, let's take the first question we have is, is it better to list all possible options for gender identity and sexual preference or to just leave a blank for the patient to fill in? I think that's a great question. Um, I think if you're very concerned about space, then having just a blank is fine. And some people actually think the blank is more affirming because you're just saying there's a huge range and there are so many things that are coming up every day that I'm not gonna have on this form because there's no way to know everything that I could put on it. Um, so that's, it's kind of a debate, you know, that's the pro of that one side. The other pro is that by having a long list of, you know, 10 to 20 options, you're showing that you're staying up to date and you're willing to update your forms, which I think actually goes a bit further in showing how dedicated you are to this work and um, becoming and being culturally humble, knowing that, you know, this is something that's evolving and changing. I think there are very few forms out there that say gender queer. And I think if a person identifies that way and sees that in a demographic form for the first time, it's just a really cool moment um, that I think is worth offering people. So my, my gut is the latter um, to have the long list. Um, it looks like we have a comment, and I know you touched on this a little, but you may want to expand on it. Um, someone noted to be careful about um, patients using one pronoun with a clinician versus with, for example, family, um, and just making sure that you don't use the pronoun um, if you're unsure of what they're using with their families. Absolutely. I think that is such an important point because just by using a pronoun, you can out someone and put them in danger. So I think that is another example of why it's so helpful to have practiced using they, them pronouns and using a person's name so that you can kind of flip into that or switch into that language um, when talking to any family members of, of patients that identify um, on the spectrum of gender diversity. Um, someone was asking where they could find information on the gender terms and appropriate definitions. Yeah, that's a great question. So what I do is I Google every, you know, one or two months um, list of gender identities and list of sexual orientation identities. And the ones that come up most frequently are the HRC website um, and a few others that tend to just be at the top of Google. And I think those are fantastic. Um, they have definitions that I've seen shared over time, so they're pretty trustworthy. Um, if you wanna get the most up-to-date, I would go to YouTube and um, just Google videos of you know, queer identity or trans identity and see how people are talking about it because the young folks in the community that are on speaking up on YouTube are usually the furthest ahead of, on that wave. Okay. Uh, the next question says, as someone beginning a career in psychology, looking into graduate study, what in your opinion is the part of the field that needs the most helping hands or what would be the best way to help trans siblings with their career? Trans, okay. Um, let me see if I can read. Can you repeat the first part of that? Sure. As someone beginning a career in psychology, looking into graduate study, what in your opinion is the part of the field that needs the most helping hands? Okay. Or, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> or the best way to help trans siblings with my career. Okay. Um, so I think the good news is, and some as someone that seems to be really passionate and barking on this graduate study, um, the good news is that there's really no redundancy that you can embark on. So I would just say 
follow what other interests you have within psychology and then merge them with this. So if you're also passionate about OCD, make that your specialty. If you're passionate about awareness, um, doing you know population studies, trying to get numbers to show how many people don't identify as cis. Um, and so I know that's a sad comment is that there's unlimited amounts of work to do at this point. Um, I think some of the biggest things that people are starting to work on that is so exciting is really trying to disentangle the impact of discrimination. So how having um, experiences of discrimination directly impacts mental health when controlling for other factors and then testing um, different interventions like testing um, a mindfulness intervention or a decentering intervention, maybe trying to do that in a 15 minute module that can be shared across the internet in an open access way would be big ways that you can influence and um, help the community. Great. Uh, someone is asking what you would recommend if they can't change the intake forms they use. Good question. Um, as someone that's been there, I get that. Um, I just try to be sneaky and I kind of ignore the demographic form in my head um, and start it in session. So as soon as I'm you know, in the room with a person, then I will do the full demographic interview as if the other one doesn't exist. To, you know, I might say like, I know you've already done a lot of forms. I'd like to just hear from you how you identify. I know it's hard to sometimes write things or sometimes forms aren't totally inclusive. So here's, you know, I'm gonna ask you how you identify across these different um, domains. And please let me know if there are any other aspects of identity that I didn't ask about that are important to you. So I would just do it sneaky one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you're working on a research study and you think it should be changed, but you don't feel like you have the power to change it, I would find a sneaky way to invite someone to give a talk like this um, and find some you know, argument for it based on the study that you're doing, and then ask the speaker to really do that work because they're in a unique position to not be risking their job. Great, we have a couple last questions. Could you please speak to some culturally responsive ways of navigating potential OCD involving obsessions regarding identity or identities? Yeah, so that's a, um, a pretty big question because um, I'm guessing, it's hard to guess exactly what you're referring to, um, but I'm guessing you mean if someone's obsessing about their identity and um, that's something that their OCD is focusing on, like maybe they're afraid of being trans or they think they're, you know, they think they're trans all of a sudden because of their OCD and they're obsessing about it. Like how do you do, um, uh, an exposure in a way that's not anti-trans. Um, and that comes up with um, fears of being gay and OCD all the time. So if that, I hope that's what you mean. Um, so basically I would recommend um, doing the same things you would do with ERP, writing scripts, you know, maybe just being, you know, not wanting to bash trans people, but writing scripts about it, you know, I become trans, I have to get um, surgery, I end up living my life as a woman, I'm never happy again, you know, whatever it is that we do for OCD, I think it's okay to do it as long as you're not being um, discriminatory or using stereotypes, like I end up on drugs or, or things like that, that wouldn't really be helpful. Um, however, I do think it's important to, to keep doing the exposures. Can you give an example of the wording you use to ask about gender, gender identity and sexual orientation in an interview? Um, so if you're interviewing a person is I think what the question is about um, to ask about gender and sexual. Um, so I would probably introduce myself. Um, I would say, hi, I'm Dr. Wadsworth. I use she or his pronouns. Um, so great to meet you today. Um, feel free to let me know if there's a name or pronouns that you want me to refer to you by as we go around the office. Um, if it's a group interview, it's a bit easier because you can just have name and pronouns 
written onto um, the hello my name is um, at the get-go or you can say um, have a sign that says if you're comfortable writing your pronouns on your name tag please do um, those are different ways that you can normalize that in an interview setting great oh I All think right. switching back to presenter role okay Give one second um, thank you, Dr. Wadsworth, and thank you to our participants for attending today's training. We would like to invite you to register for ADAA's next live webinar on September 10th, Anxiety and Depression Treatment for Immigrant, Immigrant Refugee, and Asylee Clients with Dr. Rachel Singer. We invite you to visit the ADAA website, www.adaa.org, to view all upcoming live webinars as well as our full library of on-demand webinars. If you are not yet an ADAA member, we invite you to view the many membership benefits that ADAA has to offer. ADAA members enjoy year-long access to continuing education programs, free access to special interest groups, including online peer consultation groups, promotion of your practice in ADAA's online Find a Therapist database, significant discount to ADAA's annual conference, website listings of your clinical trials, support groups, and publications, and much more. Please visit ADAA.org to learn more. On behalf of ADAA and our presenter, we thank you very much for joining us today.